Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Big Son of Mercury by Isaac Asimov. So this is the fourth novel in the extraterrestrial odyssey of David Starr, Space Ranger. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb. I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... On the barren planet of Mercury, a network of wire harnesses the great power of the sun to send it crackling out through space, creating a giant powerhouse. But this secret mission was being sabotaged and David Starr had to face an unseen, unknown enemy. The fourth of the David Lucky Star space sagas will continue to delight Asimov fans and win more to his great following. And yeah, it's kind of just one of those, it's almost like a space whodunit kind of thing. Um, there's a mystery at the heart of it that kind of slowly unfolds. Um, but for me, a lot of what I really enjoyed is actually the science to it. And there's even a mention here about the science in the foreword that I want to read to you. This book was first published in 1956, and the description of the surface of Mercury was in accordance with astronomic beliefs of the period. Since 1956, however, astronomical knowledge of the inner solar system has advanced enormously because of the use of radar beams and rockets. In 1956, it had been thought that Mercury always faced one side of the Sun, so that there was a portion that was perpetually in sunlight and a portion that was perpetually dark, with some boundary regions which sometimes had Sun and sometimes not. In 1965, however, astronomers studied radar beam reflections from the surface of Mercury and found to their surprise that this was not so. Whereas Mercury revolved about the Sun in 88 days, it, ro it rotated on its axis in 59 days. This meant that every part of Mercury was exposed to the Sun at one time or another, and there was no dark side after all. I hope that the readers enjoy this story anyway, but I would not wish them to be misguided into accepting as fact some of the material which was accurate in 1956, but which is now outdated. Uh, Isaac Asimov, November 1970. And there was a similar thing on uh, Oceans of Venus as well. Uh, so I just find it funny how, again, astronomical knowledge can change things. So a guy called Conway is talking about, um, well, Uncle Hector he is. He's Lucky's Uncle Hector. And he's asking him, how would you like to go to Mercury, Lucky? What's up, Uncle Hector? asked Lucky. Nothing really, said Conway, frowning, except some cheap politics. We're supporting a rather expensive project up at Mercury, one of those basic research things that may come to nothing, you know, and on the other hand, may turn out to be quite revolutionary. It's a gamble. All those things are. Which I thought was a great way of just referring to sort of scientific research in general. And here we learn a bit more about um, some of the experiments that are being carried out, and it's kind of got Asimov's take on hyperspace as well. Um, <clears throat> do you know about it? Not a thing. Well, it involves hyperspace, that portion of space that lies outside the ordinary boundary of the space we know. The laws of nature that apply to ordinary space don't apply to hyperspace. For instance, in ordinary space, it is impossible to move faster than the speed of light, so that it would take at least four years to reach the nearest star. In going through hyperspace, any speed is possible. The physician broke off with a sudden apologetic smile. You know all this, I'm sure. I suppose most people know that the discovery of hyperspatial flight made travel to the stars possible, said Lucky. But what about Project Light? Well, said Dr. Gardoma, in ordinary space, light travels in straight lines in a vacuum. It can only be bent by large gravitational forces. In hyperspace, on the other hand, it can be bent as easily as if it were a cotton thread. It can be focused, dispersed, bent back upon itself. That's what the theory of hyperoptics says. And Scott Minders, I suppose, is here to test that theory. That's right. Why here? asked Lucky. I mean, why on Mercury? Because there's no other planetary surface in the solar system where there is such a concentration of light over so large an area. The effects Minders is looking for can be detected most easily here. It would be a hundred times as expensive to set up the project on Earth, and results would be a hundred times as uncertain, so Minders tells me. Only now we're having these accidents. So again, very cool sciencey stuff. So, uh, Big Man goes for a shower. Big Man is ironic, he's lucky he's kind of sidekick, but he's not actually that big, but he's from Mars. And uh, I just thought this was, again, fascinating about the approach to water. It reminds me of how water is treated on Arrakis in uh, Frank Herbert's Dune. Big Man sang loudly through the shower. As usual on a waterless world, the bath water was strictly rationed, with stern warnings on the waters to the amount it was permissible to use. But Big Man had been born and bred on Mars. He had a huge respect for water, and would no more think of splashing idly in it than in beef stew. So he used detergent copiously and water carefully, and sang loudly. And Dr. Peverell, he's obsessed with the idea of the Syrians attacking the Earthmen. Um, and he makes a good point here. He goes, um, Unless we do something quite quickly to meet the danger, they will win. What have we got to oppose them? A population in the billions, true, but how many can handle themselves in space? We are six billion rabbits and they are one million wolves. Earth is helpless and grows more helpless every year. And part of that is because they get a lot of their, you know, resources and materials from space. So if a blockade was, you know, put in place, they would struggle to... I guess the same as in 
you know, if a blockade's put in place on the water and um, countries, you know, rely on boats for, for food and stuff. And Dr. Pepper Ray was talking about um, their approach to robots and how, how the Syrians think of human life. Human life, any kind of human life, doesn't mean much to them anyway. They're machine-centered. I've watched them with their metal men. They're more considerate of a Syrian robot, almost, than of a Syrian man. They would regard a robot as worth a hundred men of Earth. They pamper those robots. They love them. Nothing's too good for them. Lucky murmured, Ro robots are expensive. They have to be treated carefully. Maybe so, said Dr. Peverell, but men who become accustomed to worrying about the needs of machines become callous about the needs of men. Which is a great quote. It's a shame it's missing the opening quotation mark there. There are a few typos I spotted in this book. Uh, and then there's smoking in space, which just wouldn't happen. Um, I always find it interesting when that happens in sci-fi, when people are smoking in space. So let's uh, take a look at Lucky's Inso suit. It's a special kind of space suit that's designed for being worn on Mercury when you go out into the sunlight part of the planet. Lucky marvelled, even as he watched, at the manner in which the Inso suit had been adapted to its purpose. A glance at the edge of Mercury's sun would have been blinding to unprotected eyes, blinding forever. The visible light was bad enough in its intensity, but it was the hard ultraviolet, unfiltered by atmosphere, that would have meant death to vision, and to life itself eventually. Yet the glass of the Inso suit's faceplate was so arranged molecularly as to grow less transparent in direct proportion to the brightness of the light that fell upon it. Only a small fraction of a percent of the solar blaze penetrated the plate, and he could stare at the sun without danger, almost without discomfort. Yet at the same time, the light of the corona and the stars came through undiminished. The Inso suit protected him in other ways. It was impregnated with lead and bismuth, not enough so as to raise its weight unduly, but enough to block out ultraviolet and X-radiation from the sun. The suit carried a positive charge to deflect most of the cosmic rays to one side. Mercury's magnetic field was weak, but Mercury was close to the sun and the cosmic ray density was large. Still, cosmic rays are composed of positively charged protons and light charges repel light. And, of course, the suit protected him against the heat, not only by its insulating composition, but by its mirror-like reflecting surface, a pseudo-liquid molecular layer that could be activated by a touch on the controls. Again, talking about um, Frank Herbert's Dune, it kind of reminds me of a still suit. It does very different things, but I love that you know these sci-fi masters thought very clearly about the kind of clothing we would have to wear if we want to survive on these harsh environments. Lucky's running along, and he, uh, in an hour and a half, he estimated he's travelled some 15 miles. Which is a lot. I mean, I've been working out and trying to jog on the treadmill and doing runs and all that kind of stuff. And my fastest is like 6.5 to 7 miles an hour. So he's running like about a 10, 11. Like he's pretty much been sprinting for an hour and a half. It's not far off marathon pace for like, you know, some of the best marathon runners. And obviously he's in a space suit. But then I suppose he has less... Um, like air resistance and things, so who knows. So we get a reference to the three laws of robotics, um, which I will read out to you here. Uh, they're one of Asimov's kind of most famous creations, very relevant today, especially, you know, with the rise of AI. The first law was that a robot could not harm a human being or let one come to harm. Nothing came ahead of that. Nothing could substitute for it. The second law was that a robot must obey orders except those that would break the first law. The third law allowed a robot to protect itself provided the first and second laws weren't broken. And I love that these laws, they run throughout a lot of Asimov's work but also he plays around with maybe they can be broken. So in this case, maybe the uh, positronic brain of the robot is um, not doing so good. So Lucky is um, risking um, burning to death, while Big Man, his kind of accomplice, is risking freezing to death. They're both separate. But I like the way that Asimov highlights the kind of opposites here. Lucky's predicament was a duplicate in reverse of that which had faced Big Man some hours previously. Big Man had been threatened not by heat, but by growing cold. And that's because they may discover some life on Mercury. And yeah, that's about all I want to share from The Big Son of Mercury by Isaac Asimov. It's Asimov at his best, really. It's got some real real great bits of science to it, and the science drives the storyline, but also it's a very human story. Um, some great world building in it as well. And, um, it, you know, I read the whole thing in one go on uh, the exercise bike at the gym, so I do like it when I can read a, a book like that just in one sitting. Just really enjoy being along for the ride. So I gave The Big Son of Mercury by Isaac Asimov a four out of five. So there we are, that's what I made of The Big Son of Mercury by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.